Good to go. Colleagues, I would like to call the Territorial Leadership Committee back to order. The next item on our agenda is the election of min members to the Executive Council. In accordance with our agreed upon procedures, I will ask members to indicate whether they wish to allow their names to stand for the Executive Council positions. The 222 geographic balance on Cabinet will govern all aspects of this selection process. Once members indicate their interests, we will entertain a 10-minute speech from each nominee before we proceed to voting. Let's get things underway. I will ask all members from the northern constituencies that wish to allow their names to stand for a position on the, on the Executive Council to please rise. Thank you. Ms. Chinna, Mr. Jacobson, and Ms. Tom have indicated they wish to be considered for Executive Council membership. I would now ask all members from the LNI constituencies that wish to allow their names to stand for a position on the Executive Council to please rise. Thank you. Ms. Green, Ms. Knockleby, Mr. Riley, and Ms. Wozniak, Wozniak, sorry, have indicated they wish to be considered for Executive Council membership. To bring this portion of our proceedings to an end, I would now like to ask all those members from the southern constituencies that wish to allow their names to stand for a position on the Executive Council to please rise. Thank you. Mr. Bonnerge, Ms. Marcellos, Mr. Simpson, and Mr. Thompson have indicated they wish to be considered for, exec for Executive Council membership. Therefore, nominees for the Executive Council positions are as follows.
to lose. Thank you. Therefore, nominees for the Executive Council positions are as follows. From our northern constituencies, we have Ms. Chinna, Mr. Jacobson, and Ms. Tom. From our southern constituencies, we have Mr. Bonnerouge, Ms. Marcellos, Mr. Simpson, Mr. Thompson. And from Yellowknife, we have Ms. Green, Ms. Nocklaby, Mr. Riley and Ms. Wozniak. Each candidate is permitted to make a 10-minute speech. The speeches will be made in, al in alphabetical order, by geographic area and by surname. We will start with the Northern Constituencies nominees. So I call, call upon Ms. Chinna for her speech. I thought we were going to be all together. No, it's by region. Sorry. Um, Ms. Chinna. Mr. Left. I wanted to acknowledge before I get started that uh, the youth of Cova Lake who um, encouraged the federal election. And uh, I just wanted to uh, um, acknowledge that community. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I want to pay my respects to the leaders within ASATU for this opportunity to submit my nomination for, ca for a cabinet position. I'm seeking support from the 19th Legislative Assembly. With my passion and integrity, I bring forward 20 years of work experience and personal triumphs that have mold molded my leadership to display at one of the highest levels of government in the Northwest Territories. I am originally from Fort Good Hope and I'm a member of the Gushakotin District. I'm the daughter of Martha China and Don Fabian. I was a single mother and did raise my daughter. Presently, I am raising my niece who is 13. I did attend residential school and I do display the positive effects and experience of being educated in the residential school system. I was also raised in foster care and believe that good homes and guidance display the integrity and the willingness to do better and be better. At the age of 26, I lost my mother to cancer and raised my siblings, ages 16, 15, and 10. During that time, I was a single mother of an eight-year-old daughter with a single income. And in the following years to come, I lost my sister tragically. My story is similar to the people of the Northwest Territories and my connection to the residents of the Northwest Territories ignites the passion to work with resilience and demonstrate perseverance. I have the de determination to want to improve programs and services throughout the Northwest Territories. During the past 20 years, I have committed myself to gain work experience in the public sector and with the government of the Northwest Territories. My first employment opportunity, opportunity was with the Gushakotin Charter Community Council and the Imoga Land Corporation in Fort Good Hope. I assisted in the, de in the development of their land administration at that time, I was involved and participated in the creation and development of the community plan and zoning bylaw. I worked for municipal and community affairs, administering community land administration within the, the municipal boundary, and program delivery to establish land ownership, administering legal documents, contracts, sales, and financial issues. This position brought me to dealing with the residents at the grassroots level, who are affected by the GWT policy, <coughs> acts, regulations, that cause difficulty in program delivery for frontline workers. The experience with MACA brought me to transfer from the Beaufort Delta, Sawtoo, and the South Slave regions. During this time, I observed, I observed the programs and the delivery and the effects that it made and the changes determined by MACA and the GWT. This experience brought me to understand the importance of our local community members that are being affected by our decisions we make as a government. I was very fortunate to work the three regions out of the five in the Northwest Territories. 
which gives me a more broad perspective of where we sit as a Northwest Territories. I then furthered my experience gaining employment in Fort Smith with the Fort Smith Health and Social Services Authority as a nurse's aide. This opportunity gave me the perspective of what the health care system are enduring. I did notice the shortage of nurses, housing, accommodations were definitely a factor. In the following months, I did further work on to um, employment with forestry management in Fort Smith. I was able to realize the needs for forest fire recruits and the training needs in preparation for the forest fire season was limited. I also held a position with the Satu Health Authority assisting with medical travel and realizing even in that position to be short staffed. I also worked for the Department of Industry Tourism Investment in the Satu region working for parks and preparing for a <coughs> business symposium. During my 20 years I committed my work experience to serve the people of the Northwest Territories. I began my career as a frontline worker. I was exposed to the effects that are displayed at the grassroots level. I have seen the results of program delivery in its, in its successes and its failures, and the need to work in conjunction with our Indigenous groups, and the determination to support and finalize self-government and land claim agreements. I see the, the effects of climate change that are displayed at our local community level affecting ground stability for residential areas, affecting erosion and shoreline and the riverbanks, and the short season for the winter roads that decreases supplies to the communities. I noticed the declining of water levels, making, short seasoned, making it a short season and difficulty to receive scheduled barge services and supplies. I do look at the Northwest Territories as a whole. I do see the need to represent our local communities. I recognize the need for housing and concerns for overcrowding in this, and this as a, as a territorial issue, not at a regional level. We have seen and heard the issues that affect our health care, education, and housing systems that do not work in our communities. This opportunity brought me to experience a different working relationships and structures throughout the Northwest Territories. I was able to gain a different perspective as a minister, I see the potential to work in conjunction with Indigenous leadership and working productively and fairly with our consensus government. I would like to see improvement with our education system and to develop a strategy to improve our health care system to build a strong, healthy families across the Northwest Territories and look and work towards prevention of addictions support mental illnesses, support our home care for our elderly and people with limited mobilities. I would like to enhance economic diversification and improve the support of local businesses and utilize the services that already exist at the community level. The need to keep the money in the north is imperative. We need to develop solutions to decrease social dependency to, de to invest into our regions and become proactive of expectations of our program delivery so the people of the North qualify. I also wanted to include that I did work on a community development project and this was able to bring me to work with the people face to face. I was able to see the need and the cry out for help in all, a lot of the government services that we provide. I also see the need for addiction and I would like to work with the people of the Northwest Territories and our Aboriginal groups. I'm confident with the 19th Legislative Assembly, with my colleagues, that the support in me to become Minister is at value. I bring to the, I bring to the table years of experience, learning from the grassroots and connection to our Indigenous groups and non-Indigenous groups. I look forward to working with you in the 19th Legislative Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Min Speaker-elect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chinna. Next we have... Next we have Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, Mr. Elect colleagues of this Assembly, it's an honor for me to appear for you today, uh, in front of you today in support of electing me in a cabinet position of this 19th Legislative Assembly. I was born and raised in Taktiakta to my mom and dad, Jimmy and Bella Jacobson. I come from a very large family. 
I have lived in Tuck my whole life other than leaving for school. I was fortunate enough to meet my wife Jenny for 31 years ago in the lunch line at Grolly Hall. And uh, now we're so blessed we have six children and one grandson who we raised up in Tuck. I also provide support for our other children. We had 20 to 30 foster children that we uh, took care of over the last 20 some years. Although I've always been interested in promoting economic issues and development in the North, I've been committed to participating in supporting social and cultural life in our communities. This participation has included membership in Canadian Rangers where I served for 25 years as a local sergeant, the Education Committee acting as a director of Innovator Development Corporation. I also organized a sled dog race and events back home for our jamboree and assist our local church and social organizations. In the next few minutes, I'd like to provide members with details of my government experience, my thoughts on the economic future of the NWT. The priorities for me, improvements of our educational system, our health care, services, services and my housing issues are my main concerns. The impacts of climate change on our land. <coughs> We need to bring vision, passion in this assembly to work together from the com communities to the residents that we represent. I'm committed in working with all of you to bring this vision and passion forward to improve living conditions in our territory. Colleagues with the House, I've sat in this House for eight years, experiences in MLA, the last four years in the 17th Assembly as a Speaker. During this time, I played an active role supporting my writing in all communities in the, in the NWT. I have a solid understanding of how important it is for ministers to work in unison with regular members and build meaningful partnerships among MLAs to work together towards common goal. We'll be successful, not only for ourselves, but our regions and the Northwest Territories as a whole. I have also served as community government as a mayor for four years and as a councillor for 12 in my home community of Tuck. I'm a proud of our community and our achievements in securing one of the biggest construct, our community infrastructure of Tuck Highway, or the ITH. That was the largest infrastructure program, our infrastructure undertaken by the GNWT that came in on schedule and on budget in the, uh, 2017. It opened up servicing the residents successfully since that time. As MLA and as a speaker, I was charged with listening of all views and members, treating all equal with respect. Through these conversations, I've learned the issues and the concerns of the 33 communities and the NWT to find out so importantly, being a new member is never easy and learning process that requires you to be there for your people whenever they need you. 24-7. Whenever, however, I like new members, I've made mistakes in previous assemblies. I have learned from my mistakes. I tried my best of moving forward. With, with growth and lessons my, in mind, I put myself forward for ca this cabinet position for the North. As a consensus government, as a collective, we must be more inclusive and considerate than others in our territory. Some of our older approaches to this government need change. We need to balance and address the needs of both larger centers and smaller communities. We need to facilitate greater engagement with our, with our indigenous governments that recognize inherent right to self-government and self-determination. We welcome and respect the different uh, ethnicities, gender, cultural heritage of LGBTQS residents. We need to engage all variable participants in our decision policy making process. As a speaker, my door was always open. I commit to continuing that practice of elected to cabinet and I commit fairly, equally promoting priorities and objectives of all communities and all the residents in the Northwest Territories. As well, Everybody in the Northwest Territories were faced with the difficult economic times. We grapple with impact climate change, infrastructure <coughs> challenges. It's uncertain. The levels of support of our federal government, the Economic Conference Board says the Northwest Territories were in a grim situation. 
Canada has characterized paid close attention to our economy to seek out meaningful ways to diversify our economy and track investment. Now, firsthand in the community experience, when economic downturn occurs, people suffer. And this occurred in my own community of Tuck when the resource exploration left not once but twice in my lifetime. The small communities are hurting. Although we must continue to pursue resource-based projects, particularly which promote alternative local sources of energy, we must transition from uncertain economy dependent on only upon natural resources based upon tourism, services, and environmental rec rec reclamation. The recent reclamation projects at like Giant Mine, Imperial Oil Stock Base, Norman Wells Oil Field, have demonstrated northerners that benefit from reclamation in the, in the communities. These projects bring much needed jobs, hundreds of millions of dollars into our territorial economy. Other large projects, including cleanups, Canton, Silver Bear Mines, will soon to follow. We must ensure these projects go ahead to maximize, maximize the benefits for all these projects. To do this, we must pressure the federal government and work with them to ensure these benefits stay in the Northwest Territories. Too many dollars are spent in, uh, in the NWT are not si and siphoned away from our, to our southern companies. We cannot afford to sit by, watch these projects be operated and fly in, fly out workers. We need the people in our territory qualified and ready to work. New highways, the power infrastructure, open up prospective resources and development combined tourism, knowledge-based economy, cold weather climate research, activities, commercial fisheries, development and current proposed reclamation work that strengthen our NWT. The economy can provide businesses and training opportunities to our residents. This will also assist us in the build capacity necessary to carry forward the new economic developments on the rise. Another challenge to face the North which threatens the lifestyle impact climate change in rivers and lands and animals and our people. Recent events in my home community demonstrate that the climate change is having our land in permafrost melting and sea levels altering. The landscape is threatening of homes. Every day I look out the window in the Arctic Ocean, I see waves beating on elders' homes that, are, that the shoreline is eroding. The old ways of our people become less and less certain. The dramatic environmental in Arctic have also attracted worldwide attention. We need to recognize the interests of the world and stage will continue to increase and become more and more incorporated in global economy in our affairs. The global economy affairs, we all need them to be vigilant, protecting Arctic sovereignty aggressively, representing our noted interests in federal government worldwide in the forums. Government worldwide forums through increased participation will be able to Properly advance economic objectives. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, I challenge us, members in this House, to ensure the economic future of the NWT while adapting climate change will continue to face. This is no small task, but we have a challenge we must all face together. At the same time, we need to balance our pursuit of economic prosperity with the attention of social educational needs crucial to improve education, housing, and health care for our residents across the territory and our small communities and our youth and elders. As a cabinet minister, in addition to pursuing, pursuing the economic objectives, I will support initiative care facilities in our communities, as well as we need to increase educational standards throughout the territory, regardless of where our children live, to ensure that they compete, are competitive throughout Canada and worldwide. I believe the path forward I found that will strengthen our economy, protect our lands, follow us. In the last 15 years since my riding was represented in cabinet, my uncle Vince Steen was the last voice for Nanakput in this cabinet table. I want to build upon the successes and achievements of my past leaders and bring perspective to cabinet absent for it was far too long. I'm excited to work with this assembly, identifying priorities and reflect the needs of the territory. Territory and residents that we serve, I believe we can play an important, crucial role helping become a strong, viable territory that re reflects diversity, strength, cultures, 
and languages. With your support, it's honored and privileged to serve with, as a cabinet member, Kuyunaini Kwana Masi. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Next, we have Ms. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect, and good afternoon. I put my name forward to seek support for executive for the 19th Legislative Assembly. My knowledge and experience uh, will portray my abilities to take on this challenging role and be a voice for the residents of the Northwest Territories. I bring key components to the table that can be used to ensure accountability and transparency, transparency in the 19th Legislative Assembly. I was born and raised in Aklavik, Northwest Territories, where I was custom adopted, being the oldest grandchild of the family, um, raised in traditional Inuvialuit lifestyle. We lived a nomadic way of life moving from seasonal camp to seasonal camp, led by my dad, my dad, and my nanak, my mom, where they were the greatest team I've ever known. I realized from an early age, academics would be a key to my development and a path uh, into my future. I was always curious and perceptive in school. I want to know why things worked the way they did, so I would challenge myself to learn and understand the subjects that taught me front to back and back to front, and still to this day. I was sent, it wasn't my choice, to attend a residential school in Grolier Hall to complete my grade 12 and graduated. During this time, I met many friends from across the communities in Northwest Territorials, and I will still maintain that friendship today. Um, however, it was a challenge, as Inuvialuktun was, was the first language spoken in my family, and I quickly lost my mother's tongue. After graduation, I attended Art College, back then was the name, a business management diploma program in Inuvik. Upon completion, I began my employment with the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation as the Regional Youth Coordinator. In this role, allowed me to work with youth in the region, also working with ITK on national uh, youth initiatives. Further to this, I moved to the development side of the organization and worked my way up from accounts payable to receivable uh, eventually to assistant controller uh, for multiple business corporations while completing the Aboriginal financial organizational designation. With one more year left to complete my bachelor's degree in management with Athabasca University, I moved south to complete my degree and further develop my academic skill set. Went back to Nubik and started in community development with uh, in charge of programs such as assets, Aboriginal skills, employment training, uh, education Foundation, the National Health Initiatives, Economic Development, uh, Early Child Care Research and Culture, while managing multi-million dollar budgets in annual and multi-year funding. There was also an opportunity for me to explore and fulfill my career interest in the oil and gas company. I took a one-year secondment to British Petroleum, the BP, as the communication advisor. So the, the role of the communication advisor was to uh, liaise between the communities in the Beaufort Sea and the oil and gas interest, industries. So I did two weeks up north and two weeks in the south. Um, during this time, it allowed me to get a really good, a good understanding of oil and gas licenses in the Arctic offshore. This includes a 2D, 3D, seismic, and environmental safety mechanisms. And I, I just... I was called a week back before the tragic event in 2010, back to my organization. And coming back to the Inuvial Regional Corporation as Executive Director for Community Development and Community Programs and Initiatives, I was the Inuit uh, representative on the National Inuit Committee on Health, the NICO, as well as PHAC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and my role was to set strategy and plan policy-driven health priorities for the North. Um, I also was uh, a part of the GNWT's community wellness plans, so I took my team to each of the different communities and we developed priorities for each, each of the different communities. Then I started and completed my master's degree through Royal Rhodes University in Victoria. And my thesis at the time was based on in indigenous self-inherent rights. Back to, the, back to Inuvik and to the organization's self-government, uh, intergovernmental relations, and was quickly appointed as chief negotiator and uh, director of intergovernmental relations with the Inuvialuit. 
My responsibilities included working with board of directors, with the communities, with beneficiaries, along with territorial and federal negotiation teams. These required a variety of, we had quarterly meetings, we had community visits, we, um, we put together a field work program, and also monthly main table sessions. As the Inuvialuit representative on the GWT Intergovernmental Relations, uh, working alongside Indigenous groups in the Northwest Territories. As part of the work in negotiating a self-government agreement, there was a lot of work in the implementation, the financial, the fiscal, the tax, and communication working groups with representatives from Canada and the GWT at various tables. I was elected and served two terms as board director for the Inuvik Community Corporation, where I was vice chair during the first term and then secretary treasurer during my last term upon this recent um, election. Mr. Speaker, in the last two days, the 19th members sat down, came up with priorities for this 19th assembly. They include uh, strengthening partnership with our indigenous groups, improving mental wellness, increasing economic diversification, climate change, just to name a few. I've lived in small communities in, um, in an Eklavik, Inuvik, Fort McPherson. I also had, during my um, employment, the opportunity to reach out to some of the smaller communities. Uh, my experience, my education skill set has prepared me for this challenge is the reason I put my name forward to run for Inuvik Boot Lake, mm -hmm. me member of Legislative Assembly. I also want to acknowledge the support from my husband, Grant Coco Tom, and my son, Connor Sullivan, for supporting me to be here in this role. That's brought me to where I am today, Mr. Speaker-elect. I ask other MLAs to consider my education, vast experience, and think about, think about that today when you cast your vote, as you choose who can best represent the people of the Northwest Territories during this 19th Assembly. I also acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do. We've been tasked with many different um, challenges, and I'm just, I'm really honored to be here with everybody right now. Queen Naini, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tom. Uh, before we continue, we're asked if members could please slow down. So this, the interpreters are having a little difficulty keeping up, so just keep that in mind when you, I know it's a little nerve-wracking, but uh, we'll continue now with the Southern candidates, uh, starting with Mr. Bonnerge. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Good afternoon, colleagues. I would first like to say a huge Masi Cho to my Detro riding constituents for believing in me to represent them at the Legislative Assembly. I thank my family and grandchildren for their continuing support. I will always remember where my roots are grounded. I would also like to thank my predecessor, Mr. Michael Nadley, for his years of dedicated service to the residents of the Detro. Let me congratulate you, Mr. Speaker-elect, and I know you will do a tremendous job in your new position. I also would like to congratulate the new Premier-elect, and I'm confident you will lead the 19th Legislative Assembly to the best of your ability. I look forward to working with both of you in serving the people of the Northwest Territories. To my colleagues of the 19th Legislative Assembly, I submit my name for your consideration as a member of the Executive Council. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the fact that the 19th Legislative Assembly is the only government body in Canada, and for that matter in the world, to have a gender balanced assembly. We have, nine, we have with us nine women to look after us. I say that with deepest respect. I look forward to learning and working with each and every one of you for the next four years. Um, most of you do not know uh, my background, but I attended Sir John Franklin High School back in the day. I had the pleasure of 
Take him not only the academic stream, but playing trumpet in music class. I was also fortunate enough to take up <coughs> photography as an elective, which piqued my interest in seeing my surroundings through the lens of a camera, a hobby I still pursue today. Some of my work experiences include uh, stints as a classroom assistant, housing maintainer for the Fort Province Local Housing Authority, log builder, and worked in the building construction industry for a number of years. For the past 11 years, I was employed in project management as a project officer with GNWT Infrastructure. Previously, this was Department of Public Works and Services, better known then as DPW. I guess it's safe to say that I do know what hard work is all about. I will bring these work ethics to my position as a member of cabinet. My political career started in my early 20s as a Denaban counselor. There were many elders who shared their wisdom and knowledge with me and I am forever grateful. I pay tribute to the many knowledge keepers who have passed on. I also served as chief of the Gakwati First Nations and was involved with the Dicho First Nations as negotiating partners seeking a treaty and self-government agreement. I have also served on the ha local Hamlet Council and was currently a council councillor prior to this year's territorial election. I have been around politics for quite some time and have always kept abreast of all the current issues. I seek a pos position on cabinet as I, I am known as a team player, consensus builder, and a people person. I bring passion to addressing and solving issues that are common to our territory. It takes collaborative effort by cabinet and the regular MLAs to make informed decisions for the betterment of the people of the Northwest Territories. This is consensus government at its finest and a true testament to the people that consensus government is alive and well in the Northwest Territories. There are many challenges facing this assembly and I'm up for facing those challenges. The biggest challenge is the state of the economy and the uncertain future in terms of new economic development as our territory faces the winding down of the diamond mines. Of course, the diamond mines brought optimism to our territory when the future looked bleak after the closing of Giant Mine. The diamond mines provided much needed employment and most of all, economic and business benefits to the indigenous partners involved in the projects. Excuse me. <clears throat> we have seen that developing partnerships with the indigenous governments of the Northwest Territories can and does create economic reality and prosperity for our territory. Should I have your support as a cabinet member, I commit to providing optimism and hope for the future by opening up the lines of communications with the pretext of de developing partnerships with the indigenous governments. Of course, this will not happen without the collaborative efforts of all members of this assembly. The NWT and Nunavut Chamber of Mines and the NWT Chamber of Commerce have reached out to the members of the 19th Legislative Assembly. We heard that mining exploration continues to languish and are losing out in important investments for our territory. Only our neighbors, the Yukon Territory and Nunavut, continue to benefit from mining activities which contribute to their respective economies. According to the Chamber of Mines, the contributing factors affecting mineral explore, exploration is the onerous regula regulatory requirements and complex permitting processes. There is also the factor that indigenous governments have set aside protected areas within their land base. I believe this is to protect historical 
or culturally significant areas and to prevent any type of exploration or development. These areas may be protected and written to, into each indigenous government's land management plan or self-government agreements, and they should be respected by everyone involved. They are also concerned that mineral exploration does damage the land and leads to contamination of the water. As a cabinet member, I will suggest to my colleagues to initiate a roundtable meeting with invites to the Chamber of Mines and the indigenous governments. At the meeting, we can put everything on the table and see if we can find commonality and the next steps required to form partnerships and continued meaningful dialogue. I believe this is an important first step to understanding any concerns or aspirations for economic prosperity for the indigenous governments, the Chamber of Mines, and especially for the people of the Northwest Territories. In closing, there are a variety of priorities to be presented to the Executive Council for further work, and I look forward to this exercise with your blessing and support as a member of Cabinet. I will always have an open door policy and expect the same in return. I look forward to all the meaningful dialogue with each and every one of you and of course learning from you for the next four years. Together we can make consensus government work for the benefit of all residents of the Northwest Territories. God bless and Masi. Thank you, Mr. Bonnerouge. Next, we have Ms. Martellus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, new elected speaker. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate our newly elected Premier, Premier Cochran. I know you'll make a great leader, and I know you'll be fair. I also want to thank the constituents of my area, Thabatcha, for giving me this opportunity to stand before you today for Cabinet. Uh, my community is an amazing community with many diverse people and different interests, and they've given me this opportunity to stand here today to be part of your cabinet and to put my name forward. I'm a strong advocate for the economy. The economy is extremely important in this, uh, in this 19th assembly. We saw that we are in over a $1 billion deficit. The deficit is extremely, it has to be addressed. The building of the economy has got to be one of the major issues and not the most important issues because it also has to, we also have to settle the indigenous land claims and the outstanding land claims and um, self-government agreements and the implementation of these agreements. I too just got off leadership. It was on August 30th that I was done from Salt River and then went right into the territorial election. We all have experiences of misgivings with government and hopefully we can fill those gaps to ensure that the Indigenous file is heard by this 19th Assembly. I think it's extremely important that all people of the Northwest Territories are included in all decisions that are, that are done in partnership with what we do because it affects them. When we make a decision around this assembly, we also have to think of the little person that it affects. Because uh, many times we forget who we're representing. And I will never forget the people of the Northwest Territories. I think that uh, the social envelope is also extremely important. You know, we have to have a balance between the economic and the social envelope very important 
We have a lot of uh, uh, issues with addiction. We have issues with childcare. We have issues with apprehension of children. And uh, we have to support our workers on the front line to ensure that we do the right thing for the people of, that deliver the services to all the people of the North, and especially from our uh, to our Indigenous people. We passed in the last few days 22 priorities for the government of the Northwest Territories. As minister, I will me I'll try to ensure that we do the best we possibly can to deliver these priorities in the best ethical and honest and sincere way as possible. I stand by honesty. Ethical issues are important to me. I stand with transparency, accountability, and a very open door policy. I think we should all be approachable, whether we're on cabinet, whether we're a minister, or whether we're an ordinary member. We're all here for the same reasons. I said earlier that we are all here to serve the Northwest Territories, and I saw so many faces and everybody wanted to do that. I've learned a lot in the last three weeks. You know, you taught me many things. You taught me that uh, there are many opinions to solving a problem. Consensus is extremely important. I love this territory as I love my community. I love the indigenous people and I love all the people of the Northwest Territories. Being inclusive is extremely important. Our decisions must always, any decision we make is always dependent on what we say and do. We must be role models for the youth. We must be role models for everybody in the Northwest Territories. So when I stand here today, I bring to you a lot of experience in private industry. I bring you experience on social issues. I bring you the experience on everything because when you are a chief, you have to deal with each issue individually. You are the, you are the social worker, you are the, the person who makes the decisions for business, you are the person who has to ensure that people have food on the table, you have to do everything. And I'm offering that experience and that personal experience to this assembly and to the Northwest Territories. And with that, I hope that everybody around here realize that democracy is spoken and, uh, you know, democracy is very important. That's why we are all free in this country we call Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next on our list, we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Uh, I don't have a speech prepared. Uh, I think people have heard me speak enough in the, in the last uh, week. Um, first, I want to begin by congratulating our, our Premier-elect. Um, people have asked me, uh, you know, am I disappointed about not being Premier? Well, you, you always want to set out to, to accomplish your goals, but I, I'm not disappointed with, with the outcome because the, the, the past few weeks that I've spent with this Assembly have given me a lot of faith that we are going to move forward and we're going to deliver the kind of change that the Territory uh, wants. I'm not going to talk about um, a lot of the things I've spoken about already about the land claims process, about the, the governance uh, changes I'd like to make, because you've all heard that. So I, I want to introduce myself to you know the new members, perhaps, who, who don't know who I am. And uh, I, I see now that uh, how the importance of family in, in placing you in the territory. And so I want to I talk a little bit about my family. Uh, my mother is here in the, the gallery. She, she came to the uh, Northwest Territories in the, in the 70s, I guess, uh, from Manitoba. I grew up in a, on a farm, a farming family. Uh, she, where she met my father, uh, Rocky Simpson, who's here on the floor with us. Uh, um, 
when he was working in, in the oil and gas industry up in the Beaufort Delta. Um, my, my father's family is, uh, my grandpa is from Fort Chippewan. Uh, he grew up you know, on, living on the land and uh, came to Hay River in the 50s for commercial fishing, which is a reason a lot of us are, are in Hay River on this day. My, my Nana, who's watching uh, right now in, in Hay River, she uh, just turned 96. Uh, she came here from England in 1945. She got on a steamship, crossed uh, the ocean, got right onto a train, and after the seven-day uh, ocean voyage, she had a seven-day train trip up to Peace River in the middle of February. Uh, all she had is her fall coat that you wear in England. So it was a bit of a culture shock. There was, there was no road up to the territory back then, so it, it was a bit of a different world. And like I said, she is still in Hay River where I have uh, a number of relatives, a number of family, uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, you know, we, and we spread across the territory. I've lived in Hay River my entire life except when either myself or my parents were attending school. That turns out to be a big chunk of time um, because education is, is important to my family. I received a, a Bachelor of uh, Arts in Psychology from uh, Grand McEwen University, and I later received my law degree from the University of Alberta. I, I returned to, to the territory to work after receiving my law degree. I know it's hard for us to retain people. Once people go away to school, you know, it's hard to get them back. But I believe this is a land of opportunity, and I believe that we all have something that to contribute here, and we, and we all owe the territory something. I believe that. The territory helped me. It, it really shaped who I was, as, as did my parents, and, and their values of education, their values of uh, community service and giving back to the community. Um, my dad said if no one ran against me that uh, he was going to, because once you get a free ride, and I honestly thought that uh, <laughs> that's one person I might not be able to beat in Hay River because, uh, you know, because uh, they do do a lot for the community. And, and that's why I'm here. That's why I ran for government, because I ran for, um, for MLA because I want to give back and I want to give people those opportunities that I had. You know, I, I was lucky, and I say this all the time, I was tremendously lucky with my upbringing. I had a family that, uh, that valued education and that, that provided for me. And because of that, I want to be able to extend that to everyone else in the territory to, to the greatest extent that I can. Everyone has been talking about the economy and it's true, the economy is down. And that was another reason that I was, I was spurred to run. But you know, we've had diamond mines for a long time in the territory. We've become very wealthy as a territory, but that wealth is, is centralized in a few different places. And we need to help everyone participate in this economy. And I think education is the way to do that. And I always have a strong focus on education. Education is freedom, and we need to address it in, in all aspects of what we do as a government. In saying that, I understand that we can pour all the money we want into schools, we can, uh, you know, we can create universities, but if, if kids aren't going to school, or if they go to school and they can't concentrate because of things that are going on at home, then we're fighting a losing battle. So like everything else, the focus on education is nothing unless we, we uh, help solve the issues that are surrounding that, that are causing people to not graduate and not go to school. And those are things like mental health and addiction. You know, mental health is, uh, it, it's a growing problem, the mental health crisis in the territory. And you know, I've seen some changes here and there, but we don't treat it the way we should. We are still very reactive in terms of treating mental health issues. We need to be proactive. We need to uh, ensure that people can get out of bed in the morning because they're not depressed and that they can go to work and they can contribute. These are the kind of investments that we need to make now to, uh, you know, to provide for the future for everyone. There's, there's, an, there's no end to the issues, and I often, when I start chatting with people about what I do, I go off on tangents and I have to stop myself because there's no end to, the, to our concerns. There's issues with justice. One of my colleagues was saying, no one's been talking about justice. When it, it, it's, a, it's a major issue. There are some promising things that we're doing in the South Slave. There's a, the therapeutic model that they're implementing at the South McKenzie Correctional Center, and, and that's good, and that's one of the things that I want to make sure that this cabinet follows up on. I want to make sure that when we do something, we're, we're seeing it through all the way. And part of that is aftercare in the communities, and we've been talking about that as well. And that's something else we need to deal with. Housing is another uh, major concern. We hear from, from everyone. It doesn't matter if you're in a small community or if you're in Yellowknife. We have housing concerns. In Hay River, we just lost 150 
150 people just lost their home in Hay River when the, uh, the Hay River High Rise closed down. 150 people lost their home. We had a housing crunch before that. Now there's nowhere to go. People were bounced between. Now they bounce out of housing for a reason. There's nowhere for them to go. And so we're feeling it all across the territory. And, and these are the, some of the things that, that we need to deal with. You know, I, I, I kept my talk. I, I didn't think I was going to go this long. I apologize to everyone. Um, I, when I was talking about uh, when I was running for Premier, I had a lot of very high level ideas. But these are the kind of things that I'm concerned about on the ground that we really need to deal with. And so I just wanted to share this, uh, this with, um, with my colleagues here because we haven't had that chance to sit down. But uh, we will in the future, and I really look forward to working with this group and uh, doing great things for this territory. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. No need to apologize. You, we, you all have 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, next on the list, we have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Speaker Elect. You said 10 minutes. I'll have to slow down. We may not go through the first. First of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Premier Elect Carolyn Cochran. Um, I believe you do a great job moving forward in the Northwest Territories, uh, as, as well as our Speaker Elect Mr. Blake. I want to begin my remarks today with an acknowledgement that today's proceedings are taking place on Chief Draghi's territory, traditional home of the Yelnay Denny First Nation, and also the traditional lands of the North Slave Métis. For those of you who are new to the Assembly and for those members of the public who are listening in, allow me to introduce myself. I am Shane Thompson. It is my honour today to put my name forward for consideration as a member of the Executive Council. I've been returned by the voters to the Legislative Assembly for a second term as a member for Nehemde. I'm deeply grateful to the people of Fort Simpson, Junior River, Samba Cay, Wrigley, Fort Liard, and Nehanne Butte for their strong support and putting their faith in me for a second time. I am the son of Mary and Gordon Thompson of Hay River and the proud father of seven children and eight grandchildren. I was born and raised in Hay River and spent 23 years of is to put with the Department of Municipal and Community Affairs as a Senior Recreation Development Officer. In addition to Hay River, I've lived in Benuvik, Kudruptuk, and Fort Simpson, which has given me the chance to experience life outside in other NWT communities. Additionally, during my course of my career, I've been fortunate enough to travel to 32 of the NWT 33 communities. Spending my life Living and working in the Northwest Territories has given me the opportunity to familiar my, familiarize myself with communities and get to know the people who live in them. This helps me to understand what is important to NWT residents. By the way, the one community that continues to elude me, despite several attempts, is Powhatan. I would like to talk for a moment a bit about my personal qualifications and my outlook on Northern governance. I want to tell you how these experiences have shaped me and informed what I would bring to the job as a cabinet minister. I served as chair of the Standing Committee of Social Development for the full term of the 18th Legislative Assembly. This committee was responsible for providing oversight for the Department of Health and Social Services, Education, Culture and Employment, Housing and Justice. These departments are pro took up about approximately 60% of the government's budget. Some of the highlights as tenure of the chair of the Social Development Committee was we improved 23 bills. This included partnerships of the Standing Committee on Government, Government Operations on the Cannabis Imp Implementation Act. This federally mandated legislation worked, was a big job that had to be completed on a tight timeline. The two standing committees worked collaboratively and traveled extensively. Our review produced 20 motions to amend this bill. Some of the amendments included allowing for the potential for private cannabis vendors in the NWT, clarifying the rules around local plebiscites on private sales, and providing authority to the minister to make important regulation respecting cannabis cultivation and cannabis smoking in areas adjacent to the public places such as school grounds and business establishments. I'm very proud of the work that the Social Development Committee did, working with the Minister of Justice and his senior officials on the Corrections Act, and working with the Minister of Health and Social Services and his senior officials on the Tobacco and Vapor Products Control Act. Both of these reviews involved an unprecedented level of cooperation between the GMWT departments and Standing Committee and resulted in sweeping changes to proposed acts. My experience as a Standing Committee Chair taught me the importance 
of the work done by Redwood members and standing committees and how this vital review by elected legislators improve proposed legislation by moving it forward by government. As a member of cabinet, I commit to ensure that my department is prepared and empowered to work collaboratively to the greatest possible degree and with the appropriate standing committee. This includes seeking more extensive community input on proposed legislative initiatives at the earliest possible opportunity. I had the second best attendance for the 18th Assembly. I am proud of this record, which speaks to my dedication and to my job. I work hard to stay on top of many issues as possible, including standing committees, or attending meetings of standing committees that I did not serve on. I am also proud of my voting record. I worked hard for each minister to reach agreement on issues and approve budgets for residents of my riding and NWT. I voted not to support or defeat cabinet, but according to my conscience, based on what I understood to be the best interest of the communities and the people who elected me. If elected cabinet, I will continue to bring this philosophy of hard work and fair play to my new role. I believe true consensus government means building positive working relationships with each member of this house no matter how widely our beliefs differ. As a member of cabinet, I commit to walking the halls of this building, reaching out regularly, regularly by phones, phone calls, and emails to break down any perceived barriers between regular members and cabinet ministers. I believe it is the responsibility of a cabinet minister to provide strong, clear political direction to the bureaucracy and to ensure that our dedicated and knowledgeable public service takes the necessary steps to implement that direction. I look forward to being challenged by regular members and by my cabinet colleagues both to excel in this area. I also commit to reaching out to each member individually, especially with where work is being done by my ministerial portfolio, portfolio has potential impact on your constituency. I will work actively to seek your invitation and find opportunities to travel to your communities to better understand your concerns and those of your constituents. I commit to re regularly reaching out to the standing committees, not only to inform committee of work of my department or departments, but to seek your guidance, thoughts, and input before making key decisions on policies, programs, and legislative initiatives. I know that we may not be able to reach agreement on all issues at all time, but I pledge you to, to ensure that the views of the standing committees will be sought, heard, and carefully considered before important decisions are made. As important as I do, I will do my best to explain the decisions I make and the direction I give the, my department so that during these times when your quest does not be fully met, you understand the rationale that has shaped the final decision. Your satisfaction and I com communicate frequently, sincerely, and responsibly, responsibly will be the measure of my success in this area. I want to talk about some issues that are important to me. During my 23 years in the Spartanburg Division, with municipal and community affairs, I did dedicated my career facilitating people working together to provide opportunities for young people to learn and grow. This has been an important part of my life and something I always remain committed to. I believe this government must do a better job with respect to providing meaningful summer employment opportunities for our students, not so that they have a paycheck, but so their future so our future leaders get hands-on learning it during meaningful work that helps these students build skills and understanding. Like many of you, I worry about the northern economy and about maximizing opportunities for northern employment. I believe the GMWT must look carefully at its procurement practices to ensure that, that, what, that work which could be done by northern companies is not needlessly going to southern contractors. I also believe strongly that we must come to terms with how the GMWT will need to change it in the future in order to settle outstanding claims. Through Committee Work on Public Lands Act earlier this year, I have become more clearly, more painfully aware that even that ever of how the ever how the NWT colonial legacy has continued to decades of land mismanagement, which caused unnecessary heartbreak and stress for the people across the NWT. We need a plan to resolve those outstanding individual claims. It will show faith to the people of the Northwest Territory that this government is listening to their concerns and will show up the economic potential of our small communities by increasing certainty over land ownership. Finally, while this is not the last of the issues that matter to me, it is one of the more important ones. I believe we must do more as a government to support our elders. As I have said in this House before, I would like to see the GNWT legislate a senior advocate who works to ensure the needs of the members of this vulnerable 
demographic are being met. While these issues are important to me as a political leader, I will work equally hard as equally as hard to fulfill the direction set by this assembly and our and our priorities for the benefit of the NWT. As a member of this assembly, every single one of you was selected by your constituents to represent their concerns. I deeply respect the responsibility that has been placed in, e in you to be the voice of the people you represent. If you put your trust in me today to serve as a member of the Executive Council, then I will make you this pledge going forward to go to always keep this respect in the forefront in my mind, to serve as a constant reminder that being a, a member of Cabinet does not make anyone more important than a regular member of this House. It just adds new responsibilities to the role. I also pledge to the people in handy that I will continue to be available to my constituents to help them help you address and hopefully resolve your issues. I am grateful for this opportunity to speak to you all today and thank you for your support and events. Thank you. Mr. Cho. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Next we have the Illinois candidate starting with Ms. Green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm here on Chief Draghi's territory and that I am a visitor here. The 18th Assembly was my first term in this House and the first time ever in an elected position. I was a regular MLA, Chair of the Caucus, Deputy Chair of the Standing Committees on Social Development and Rules and Procedures, and Chair of the Special Committee on Increasing the Representation <coughs> of Women in the Legislative Assembly. I am thrilled to congratulate Carolyn Cochran on her win. This is the beginning of the change we were elected to bring about in this 19th Assembly. In all these different roles, I've had an opportunity to learn about how, things, about how government operates, what this House does, and how to get things done. I stand ready to put this learning into action to accomplish our shared priorities, a healthy, inclusive, and prosperous future for all of us. In the next few minutes, I'm going to review my lessons learned, talk about how they strengthen my bid to be on Cabinet, and lastly, I'll fill in a little of my own background. Lesson number one, if you do your homework and come to the table prepared, you can be very influential. That means reading the briefing material, digesting the steady stream of reports, letters, and studies that come from colleagues, allies, and lobbyists. It means analyzing all this information and thinking about what it means to the residents of the Northwest Territories. I have these abilities and strong skills to communicate what I have learned. Lesson number two. In order to move on our shared priorities, you have to create solid working relationships based on honesty and respect. I was able to do that, especially with the ministers of the social envelope departments. Together, we worked on a variety of initiatives, from creating a sobering center in downtown Yellowknife, to lobbying for a specific plan to reduce core housing need. Of course, I didn't get everything I wanted, but I got more by working with the ministers than by ignoring or antagonizing them. Lesson number three, work with your colleagues on your side of the house. None of us get to choose who we work with, but we all have an opportunity to learn from our colleagues and about the communities they represent. I served with most of the small community MLAs and heard firsthand about the challenges of crowded housing, food insecurity, limited employment, unsuccessful education, and the lack of hope for a different future. I want to give a special shout out to Tom Bolio and to Michael Madley for their wisdom and guidance. I will miss them <coughs> being here. Lesson number four. Standing committees in consensus government play a, an important oversight role, whether for the budget, legislation, or policy. As a group of regular MLAs, we were able to influence cuts and spending in budgets, 
help shape policy responses to key issues such as child and family services and the foundational review for Aurora College. I am most proud of my role in improving the Corrections Act. I contacted expert interveners and asked them to provide briefs that would strengthen the Act by making it more specific. Staff at the Department of Justice worked with us to make changes and together we ended up with a better Corrections Act. This is consensus government at its finest. Lesson number five, take on a leadership role to advance your own priorities. I introduced five motions during the last assembly, four passed with the support of my colleagues. The motions were about creating a disabilities action plan, which was completed, creating a plan to reduce core need in housing, which was completed, creating a plan to fully fund junior kindergarten, which was completed. And the motion I'm most proud of, okay, wait. <laughs> Committing to action to increase the representation of women, which was completed. <laughs> so these are my lessons. Now I'd like to turn to considering how the, all these lessons apply to Cabinet. We expect Cabinet Ministers to do the work and come to the table prepared. I've demonstrated I can do that. Second, you have to cultivate your allies in order to action your shared priorities. I have demonstrated I can do that. Third, your colleagues have a wealth of experience to offer from their lives and experience. I recognize that and value it. Fourth, standing committees are essential to consensus government and developing good working relationships are the starting point for moving on budgets, policy, and legislation. I appreciate that, and I commit to working closely with standing committees. Finally, I'm always going to support someone else's good idea if it makes sense and will improve the lives of the residents of the Northwest Territories. I'm not going to review my own priorities. They are among our shared priorities that will be tabled tomorrow, and I commit to implement them without reservation. Now I'm going to talk about who I am and what I did before I was elected in 2015 and again this month. I am living the dream of every immigrant. My family came here from England when I was a child, and it's obviously the best thing they ever did for me. By coming to Canada, I have had a wealth of opportunities, and the greatest of these was education. I was the first person in my family to go to university. I earned a Bachelor of Arts in History at the University of Saskatchewan, a Master of Arts in History at the University of Calgary, and a Master of Arts in Journalism at the University of Western Ontario. I am also a proud lifelong learner, most recently completing a certificate in fundraising management from Ryerson University. I was able to apply my skills and knowledge throughout my career at the CBC where I worked for 16 years in Labrador for five years, briefly in Nunavut, and then finally here for the last nine years of my career. In all that time, I traveled to 27 communities in the Northwest Territories to cover stories, including the regulatory review of the Mackenzie Gas Project, and I used the information that I acquired in my master's degree in history to cover resource development, particularly mining. That was coal in Cape Breton, nickel in Labrador, and diamonds when I arrived here. I feel I have a very solid base of information about mining economies like our own, on which we depend, and about oil and gas from my reporting. I was able to transform volunteer work at the YWCA into my day job, so I left the CBC 10 years ago. I had a comprehensive lesson in the needs of vulnerable populations in the Northwest Territories. Although many YWCA services are based here in Yellowknife, many of the clients come from other communities. They are rebuilding after instability and need the wraparound services that will help them succeed, and they do succeed. 
What you will get from me is evidence-based decision-making. That is the person I am. You will also get my heart and dedication to improving the lives of Northerners, particularly those who are vulnerable because they are marginalized. I made a long-term commitment to the North when I moved to Yellowknife almost 20 years ago from Labrador. I got married to my partner Janice McKenna in the gallery. We adopted a child from the Delta, and when my mom retired in 2007, she moved here too and lived in Yellowknife until her death last year. Eleven years ago, my partner started a business, a funeral home. We learned how to write a business plan and how to run a business. The funeral home has expanded and now employs two full-time staff and two part-time staff. It also operates in Hay River. It hasn't been an easy journey, but I'm proud of its success and the excellent service it provides. In summary, I bring a lot to the table. Experience in diverse fields, a broad knowledge of the Northwest Territories, and an ability to collaborate. I was and I am still excited by the potential of the North and its journey to self-determination. What I offer you is the ability to work hard on our shared future, my integrity and a results-based orientation. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Green. Next we have Ms. Nottleby. I'm Ms. Nottleby. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to try to speak slower. I'm the youngest of four children, so I learned very early on. I needed to speak quickly if I wanted to get what I had to say out there so everyone could hear me. Um, so a lot of times we are asked as, or as people sitting in this house why we wanted to be politicians. And I can honestly say to you that I never wanted to be a politician. My reason for running solely has been because of what I have seen in my experiences in living in the North. Um, I realize that our government often doesn't have a voice that represents science-based decision-making in the House or brings the skill set that I can bring to the table. While I'm not experienced within the government of the Northwest Territories, I am far from inexperienced. What I bring to the table is 13 years of Northern engineering experience working on the ground with Indigenous workers, Indigenous groups, as well as um, other project managers, engineers, scientists, community members, Indigenous organizations, development corporations, as well as other consultants. Um, I've worked all over the North. That includes Nunavut and uh, the Yukon. Um, I've spent time in your communities. I've drilled um, uh, holes to investigate what your foundations need to be for your buildings, and I've watched everything change. Um, the climate is changing. There are impacts happening, and while those are affecting your communities, they're also affecting my projects. I, too, was dealing with the ice roads melting. I, too, am dealing with low water levels so that we can't get the barged equipment in to do your work. Um, all of these things that I have seen as I've traveled around in the north, including to mine sites as well, um, I wanted to bring that experience to the table and bring a different lens to show that we can be doing things differently in the north, that we can be a leader in climate change adaptation and research. Um, while I may have a very science-based background, and I found that as we've been moving through our priority session, setting session, there's been a lot of discussion about social issues versus economic issues. It's very easy to try to pigeonhole things or put them into silos. But one of the things that I'm really noticing as we go through this is how intertwined everything in the North is. The things that I may consider to be an economic driver, others can see the social ramifications of that. A huge issue, I believe, is our economy. Where I've now been, I know through the campaigning process and period, I was very much labeled an economy infrastructure type person. Now, however, I would argue that if we don't have our economy going, we're going to have a huge increase in social issues going forward. So that's an area where I think that uh, we need to stop looking at things as being economic or social and recognize that they're all integrated and that goes for all of us as well. While I may be uh, sort of labeled as the economic candidate or the economic person or the infrastructure person, I bring a real balance to the assembly. I have been very active in social issues or social groups within uh, Yellowknife since I arrived here 13 years ago. 
I've been a director with the YWCA. I've been a Girl Guide leader for 12 years. I've been working with our youth, and I've been advocating strongly for women in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM. Um, and I believe that all of those, that work and that volunteer experience will bring to me a skill set and a balance that I can use to uh, tackle all of the issues and problems that we may be facing as we move forward. Um, in my work as a professional engineer, I've worked at the giant mine. I've been there for three years uh, solely on site, and I've worked on that project as a consultant. I believe I'm one of the few people in this room that can bring that knowledge to the table. Um, as well, in the rest of my work, I've done a lot of remediation and environmental assessment work. I go out to these sites, I see what is happening when things are done, not done right. And I see the impacts that that has on the communities, on the people, and on our budgets. If we can only do things right and we took a proactive approach to things, we would be able to prevent a lot of the issues that happen. We won't be having another giant mine. We do have a regulatory system that will prevent that. Now, however, we need to make sure we have people in cabinet that can understand the implications of certain projects and be able to balance the, the economic benefits with the social benefits. Um, I know that I've been, in my work with the business service or the indigenous development corporations that there is a real appetite for mining and, and resource extraction in the territory. Um, I feel that I bring a really unique skill set and uh, an experience in that area that would be very beneficial to all of us trying to move this territory forward and out of this economic slump that we find ourselves in. I'm a, uh, throughout our conversations in the priority setting, I've been a firm advocate for northern retention and northern businesses and contracts staying in the north and work being done by northern workers. That is something I promise you right now, no matter what side of the table I end up sitting on, that that is the lens and that is something that I will continue to push for and advocate for always. Um, when it comes to the climate change issue that I brought up earlier, I, am, I have been trained in the PIVC process which is an Engineers Canada protocol that's used to assess infrastructure, uh, climate impacts on infrastructure changes, or sorry, climate changes on infrastructure. Um, I believe I can bring that lens to the, to the table and help us all to see things from the bigger picture when it comes to the impacts on our infrastructure. Um, another area in which that I'm, I'm quite proud of has been my um, activity, my involvement in my professional association. Uh, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut Association of Consulting Engineering Companies. Or sorry, uh, sorry, getting my two associations mixed up. So, uh, my professional engineers and geoscientists. Um, there I've been a two-term counselor, um, and I've had a lot of involvement with uh, the committee work there. I've been active in um, planning and presenting at our professional development uh, conference every year, and I also act as a mentor to young women that are entering the engineering and geoscience fields. Um, another thing that I was speaking the other association I was speaking to is the Association of Consulting Engineering Companies of the Northwest Territories. I'm proud to say I was the first female president of that association, and I represented the Northwest Territories on the, inter or the national and international stage in Ottawa, uh, spending time on Parliament Hill and meeting Justin Trudeau. I won't show you the really embarrassing photo of me kind of fangirling over him, as uh, maybe that's, that shine is kind of dim uh, sorry, dimmed a bit. Um, so all of these things, I shouldn't say that, I guess, <laughs> uh, going forward, but I do think that what I'm trying to get at here is that I have a broad range of experience and I'm comfortable either being at a work site, on the ground with workers, all the way up to the leaders of our country and beyond. So I feel like that's another asset that would be really important in working in the North because in politics in the South, it's a very civilized, it's a very set out protocol, things are, you know, and people aren't really, I'm not sure how much filters from the people on the ground all the way up to the top. But in the north, that's completely different. We're going to be going into places where we're going to have to get along and be able to work with and talk to and learn from and listen to people that maybe aren't on the same field or in the same career area that we are in. I feel that I can do that quite easily and I'm able to move between the different communities. Um, when it came time to decide about whether or not I was going to put my name forward for cabinet, um, I had always been given the advice that it was better to sit and wait, take one turn, learn how to be a regular member, and then that way I'd be more effective. And I know I would be effective as a regular member. However, as my answer to the media when they asked that was that I was going to wait and see, and I was going to look at the skill sets 
of the rest of you that are, have been elected and make my decision at that time. When I look around the room, I see an amazing set of skill sets here. I'm actually really, really encouraged. Day one, we have lawyers and nurses. We have people involved with uh, other parts of the health community. We have social advocacy people. We have environmental people. We have infrastructure people. Um, so I know that no matter who does end up in our cabinet, we are going to be well served by those people. And I have every intent to work collaboratively no matter what side that I end up on, whether it be you know, in cabinet working in one of the portfolios that I think I'm actually quite suited towards, or on one of the portfolios that maybe doesn't seem to be my natural fit. However, there's nothing out there that does intimidate me, and I think I could take on any one of those portfolios. But when I look around here, I see that we need to have this balance. We need to have people that can look at all sides of the, of the issue. I will be listening to all of you. My door will always be open. I will always come forward with good ideas. And I can tell you right now that my intent for the territory is to do good. I'm not in this for my ego. Uh, if I was, I don't think I would have made it through the campaigning period. I'd already have been long gone. So I want to say that I just want to bring the skill sets that I have. I want to use the knowledge that I've gained and the, the uniqueness of that skill set and that voice that I have to do good things for this territory. And I know that I can be very, very effective as a cabinet minister. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Knuckleby. Next we have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I'd like to start with congratulating our uh, Premier-elect, uh, and I look forward to working with you uh, no matter what side of the House I end up on. Um, I'd like to use my time today to talk a little bit about myself, my experience, and my approach uh, as a Cabinet Minister in this 19th Assembly. I'm on the ballot as one of your choices to serve as a Yellowknife MLA on the Executive Council. My mother's uh, family is uh, Ukrainian and French-Canadian. Although Shirley Viancourt spoke French in Northern Ontario, the language was not spoken at home and was lost. My father, Thomas O'Reilly, came from the Republic of Ireland to Canada in 1955, and we still have many relatives there. I was born in Hamilton, Ontario in 1958, so I'm going to let you do the math but I do qualify for a free parking sticker with a city and uh, seniors extended health benefits. I grew up in uh, southern Ontario. Uh, I skipped grade 12 for a day in May 1976 to go into Toronto to watch the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline inquiry. That's probably what got me hooked on the north. I went to the University of Waterloo where I graduated with a bachelor's in environmental studies and stayed on to do a master's in planning. My thesis work was on land management in the Yukon where I spent three summers. I worked in Ottawa for Environment Canada after I graduated in 1983, but my heart was in the north. So I interviewed for and accepted a position with the Denny Nation as a land use planning coordinator in 1985. In 1987, the position changed to a joint Denny Métis uh, uh, assignment. It was a great job as I worked with regional staff that included David Kruko, Gina Bea, Michael Nadley, Violet Camsel Blondin, and Raymond Jones. We traveled to most of the communities uh, in the Northwest Territories, uh, south of the tree line, and met with many elders and harvesters, many of whom are, which no longer, are, are no longer with us. I remember staying with Napanani Norbert. Uh, hearing Gay Beccinelli talk about crossing the Mackenzie Mountains on foot, losing at cribbage to Dolphus Lenny, fishing for pickerel off Dolphus Jumbo's dock at Samba Cay, and listening to Frank Laviolette uh, talk about buffaloes. My other work experience includes being a sessional instructor at Aurora College in the former Native Studies program, executive assistant to the Denny National <coughs> Chief, uh, opening a, a northern office for the Canadian Polar Commission, 10-year stint as the research director for the Canadian Arctic Resources Committee, where we looked at issues like impact and benefit agreements, policy options for mining, and intervened in the environmental reviews of three diamond mines. And another 10 years as executive director for a public environmental oversight agency for the Academy Diamond Mine. Some of my other uh, work experience and volunteer work uh, includes three terms as a city councillor here in Yellowknife, where I led negotiations of a memorandum of understanding with Yellowknife's Denny First Nation, waste reduction initiatives, and efforts toward an energy plan to save money and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
11 years uh, on the Waste Re Reduction and Recovery Advisory Committee, reporting to the Minister of the Environment and Natural Resources, when the Beverage Container Deposit Program and an Electronic Waste Recycling Program were developed, and negotiation of the Giant Mine Environmental Agreement with the federal territorial governments, the Illinois Denny First Nation, North Slade Métis Alliance, City of Yellowknife, and Alternatives North that set up an oversight body and also has responsibility for ongoing research and development. So I have a broad uh, range of experience working with public governments and Indigenous peoples and their governments. I also have an in-depth knowledge and experience related to the environment and resource management. These will be important for whoever serves in Cabinet. I hold people accountable for their commitments and obligations, but also work collaboratively and get results. What was accomplished in the 18th Assembly? There were many successes in the last Assembly that I helped contribute towards. We will soon have 911 service for the Northwest Territories and Ombud for the Northwest Territories. There was serious planning towards a university for the Northwest Territories. Modernized elections with more opportunities to vote as uh, recommended by the Rules and Procedures Committee that I chaired. Increased support for women in leadership and efforts to make the Assembly friendlier for MLAs with younger families. Tougher and binding rules for MLAs with an in, uh, independent integrity commissioner, also from the Rules and Procedures Committee. More committee business was conducted in public than ever before uh, with improved reporting of these meetings. Hundreds of changes were recommended by the regular MLAs to the legislation put forward by Cabinet, and many of these changes were accepted by the ministers. A much improved Corrections Act developed cooperatively with regular MLAs. Improved access to information protection of privacy legislation. New protected areas legislation that lays out a clear process and responsibilities. Following suggestions from Cabinet, I developed a private member's bill, the only one from the last assembly, that helps clarify cremation services and was supported by both sides of the House. And I worked with the Minister of Justice who agreed to carry out a review of victim services programs in support here in the Northwest Territories. Having served uh, one term as regular MLA, I know what it is like to be on that side of the house and have learned from that experience. There are many ways we can improve consensus government. Much of this was set out in the report of the Special Committee on Transition Matters, and I volunteered to serve on that committee. Some of our recommendations, including better orientation and ongoing training of MLAs, and we've been living some of that experience over the last three weeks, uh, setting clear and fewer priorities, Options for the structure and selection of cabinet and standing committee, improved and more collaborative budgeting, midterm review with a focus on priorities, and improvements to how legislation is developed, introduced, and reviewed, including future regulations. You heard my priorities uh, for the 19th Assembly on October the 8th, where I laid out a vision of where the Northwest Territories can and should be 10 years from now, and I'm going to try to highlight some of that again for you. A diversified economy where we would produce a lot more of what we consume. Our workforce would more closely reflect the cultures and diversity of the NWT. We would have vibrant small communities, regional centers, and a capital that serves all of our residents. Indigenous language was, languages would, be continued be, or would continue to be spoken in each of the regions and taught in our schools with improved access to all government services in all our official languages. There would also be a strong French first language education system that would control its own emissions. Il y aurait aussi un système solide d'enseignement du français langue première qui contrôle ses propres admissions. All of our citizens would have access to affordable, suitable, and adequate housing. Our communities would be self sufficient for their energy needs, and there would be a solid plan in progress on dealing with climate change mitigation and adaptation. Caribou herds would once again be thriving. There would be a fully funded and uh, functioning integrated environmental and resource management system. Legally binding water agreements and land use plans would all be in place uh, partly to protect us from upstream threats. There uh, would be a, a new confederation of regional indigenous governments and a territorial public government with strong community governments set out in the constitution for the Northwest Territories. So why should you vote for me as one of the Yellowknife cabinet member, uh, members? I worked very hard in the last assembly as my attendance record shows. 
I participated in as many community or committee meetings as I could, so I have a reasonable understanding of what is happening in many of the departments and across TNWT as a whole. I strongly believe in evidence-based decisions. I ask tough questions, do my homework, and come, pre come prepared to meetings. I fully intend to continue in these roles no matter what side of the house I end up on. There needs to be a proper balance between big infrastructure projects and long-term investment into programs and services for our peoples. Decisions should be communicated openly, made transparently, with reasons and evidence provided. Over the last couple of days, we have collectively developed our priorities for the 19th Assembly. We will need the right people in Cabinet to help develop a mandate to achieve these priorities. I believe that I am one of those people based on my knowledge, experience, and work ethic, and I ask for your support. Thank you. Merci. 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 Juana. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Next, we have Ms. Wozniak. Merci, Monsieur le Président élu, et félicitations à notre récemment élu Premier ministre Ian Cochrane. Bon après-midi à tous et mes collègues. But first, I want to give a lengthy introduction to myself. As we've all found, although we've been speaking about our priorities and our vision, we don't necessarily know a lot about one another's backgrounds. I was born and raised in Calgary to Ed and Bev Wozniak, who are first-generation immigrants to Canada. They both grew up north of Edmonton on farms where their parents didn't speak English. In fact, my uncle still lives on my mother's farm and only had running water when I was an adult. I met my birth family when I was an adult living in Toronto. My birth mother found me, Shelley Coons, from the Lacobiche area of Alberta. And then my birth father also met me, Stephen Woke. And I discovered he's a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. He immediately sent me the paperwork seeking for me to, have to join the Métis Nation of Alberta. No longer living in Alberta at the time, that wasn't possible. But I was I had the opportunity to look at my ancestry and see the line that traced straight back to the Lajimodier family and the founding of the Red River Settlements in Manitoba. And although I wasn't raised in the Métis culture, I am deeply proud of this heritage. None of my parents had the opportunity to attend university. Every one of my parents made sacrifices to make sure that I would have the opportunity to dream and the opportunity to follow whatever dreams I had. When I attended my undergraduate at the University of Calgary over 20 years ago now, it sparked in my mind, why is it that we don't all have the opportunity to dream? And why is it that we don't all have the opportunity to follow our dreams? When something holds a member of our society back, it holds us all back. It holds back our wellness, individually and as a group, and it holds back our collective prosperity. A few years later, I decided that the one way that I might help seek change would be to help change the rules. And that's when I went to law school. I decided to learn about the rules that sometimes restrict us, but also by learning about a way that we can help challenge inequality, challenge unfairness, and demand better from our government. And if you had asked me back then whether I might eventually run for office, I would likely have laughed and told you that my plan was more to take governments to court rather than stand in one. My husband, a geologist, back in 2007, took an opportunity here in Yellowknife. I opened my own law practice, attended circuit courts, I believe in every community that has a circuit court here in the Northwest Territories. My regular stomping grounds were in fact the Saks Harbor Palachuk and Lilhoptuk circuit, where I had many wonderful opportunities to visit. As a lawyer, you have to understand a person's story in order to truly be able to help them and to present their case. You stand up and you own their story on their behalf. And so to do that, I met with not only my clients, but their parents, their spouses, sometimes their children. I had tea in their homes. And I heard them tell me heartbreaking stories of childhood trauma, family breakdown, residential school experiences, poverty, mental illness, and addictions. I realized that I was now in a place that I needed to be in order to help make positive change for people and to help seek justice and better more equality. When the eldest of my two children was born, almost eight years ago now, I realized I had to take a step back from mothering all my clients. And so my practice evolved away from criminal practice. 
I joined a fully Northern-owned and fully Northern-operated law firm and expanded into more general litigation. What that meant was I was now having the opportunity to help small and medium-sized businesses across Northwest Territories. I worked with government departments, ran coroner's inquests, did child protection work, worked with environmental regulatory boards, worked with professional organizations, including the teachers and nurses, worked with other governments on their behalf as well, the city of Yellowknife and some small community governments as well. I very soon developed a balanced and broad practice that gave me perspective on social envelope as well as government practice, government foundations and business needs. And I realized that at my core, what drives me and motivates me has never changed, is that I want to advocate for creative and effective solutions that help people and improve communities and improve societies. I want to help solve problems. That is true across sectors and it's true across industries. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. I was counsel last year at the National Inquiry into the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. The inquiry was mandated to examine essentially every system in society, from our government relationships, education, healthcare, justice, and even relationships with industry. And we were being asked to help find solutions for why there was anything less than equity in our society. I also have had the pleasure of serving with now Senator Don Anderson on the steering committee that designed the Domestic Violence Treatment Option Court here in the Northwest Territories and later the Wellness Court as well. These are courts that are seeking, again, creative solutions to help improve the situation facing victims and offenders, to actually go to the root of what causes crime, and to truly collaborate across departments, because that's the only way those solutions are going to be solved. I've appeared many times before standing committees, and in fact, before now some of my colleagues, on behalf of many organizations, including the Canadian Bar Association and the Chamber of Commerce, always there advocating for new solutions. As my career evolved, what surprised me was that although criminal court is flashy and fun, what I truly love is administrative law, which if you haven't heard of that, it's everything outside of the courtroom. Essentially, it's all the decisions made by a minister, boards and tribunals like student financial assistance, the education authorities. It really is how we make fair decisions. And so my work has evolved where I've actually had the opportunity to teach boards and tribunals and decision makers how to structure a fair process, how to make a decision that actually meets a legal standard of being reasonable, and how to give good reasons so that the people that are being affected by your decision understand why you've made it. I've applied that work in a lot of different areas. I've acted as the President of the Law Society of the Northwest Territories, as the Secretary and Director of the Northwest Territories Chamber of Commerce, as appointed as the Chair of the Legal Aid Commission, and to the Income Appeals Assistance Committee, as well as many other community positions. All the while, I've found that fair and effective processes to drive rational decision making that benefit people, community, and society is true across sectors and industries. And that's the approach I want to bring to Cabinet. And so the three commitments I'd like to make specifically are a commitment to continue to, to be committed to people, to relationships, and to working and understanding the stories of others, starting right at the front lines of all government services and continuing right up to every person in this chamber. I'd like to make a commitment to continue to seek creative and effective solutions. And the process of solution finding doesn't end when you think you found the solution. You need to implement your solution. You need to make sure it actually has the results that you need to fix the problem you were trying to fix. Because if it doesn't, you need to go back and be more creative. And when I say you, I actually should say we. Because it's not about solutions that I might have. My role isn't necessarily to come up with the solutions, it's to go out and help people find those solutions and bring them forward. And my third commitment would be to fair processes and reasonable decision making. Reasonable decisions that I'm prepared to explain so that everyone that's affected by them understands why I've made them. I thank you very much for your consideration today. Thank you, Ms. Rosnick. Uh, colleagues and members of the public will take a 15-minute break before we get into the questions. Thank you.
Members, uh, we are now permitted to ask a maximum of one question to be directed to all Executive Council candidates. Candidates will have one and a half minutes to answer each question. Again, I will be enforcing this time limit consistently today. The floor is open for questions. Mr. Norn. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. During our Northern Leaders Roundtable last week, we heard several times from our Indigenous leaders that there have been constant communication breakdowns and a lack of trust with our government. In my writing, there have been instances where invites to, uh, were ignored uh, for, for uh, business to the community. To me, this is unacceptable. So my question to you as a ministerial candidate is, if elected as minister, how will you ensure that your respective departments keep open lines of communication with our Indigenous and community governments? Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Norton. First on our list, we have Ms. Wozniak. Um Members, please, please uh, be mindful of the interpreters. They ask that people please slow down a bit. So. Keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. Trust has been at the core of my professional life as a lawyer uh, for over a decade now. You can't ask someone to come to you and share with you something that they may not share with anyone else in the world if they don't trust you. And you then have to take that and move it forward. But it's not just about clients that I'm serving who are sharing their personal stories with me. In order to get anything done, I have to have trust with somebody who's on the opposite side of a file with me. Someone with whom I may have an adversarial relationship. We will get more done if we can actually trust each other. Trust is built and trust is easily broken. And as I developed relationships with other lawyers, with clients, with judges, with other decision makers, it's how you engage, it's how you do things, and it's when you make a promise that you're going to do something, you do your best to follow through. If something changes and you can't do it, you need to tell them why, and you need to be straightforward and upfront. And you develop a reputation very quickly as someone who you can or cannot trust. I think it starts at the top. And so for that, for that reason, I'm speaking about how I would present relationships that are full of trust. But it has to go to the front lines as well. And so to me, as a leader of a department or a ministry, I would expect to be walking the front lines of whatever ministry I'm in, developing trust with people at the front, and I'd expect whatever DM or assistant DM would be alongside me along the way so we can develop trust starting at the front lines of a department all the way up to the top. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woz Woznik. Next we have Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. I guess working with uh, leadership back home, um, I think open dialogue, open door approach and working with our different uh, um, land claim groups and different uh, right across the territory, I think what we have to be is uh, transparent and openness to, to work and make change on their behalf and uh, I think we, if we work together, all together, we could get uh, basically what we want all done for the, for the people of the uh, of the different land claim groups and so thank you very much thank you mr jacobson next we have mr bonnerge <clears throat> yeah thank you for the question um of course i would like to have open lines of communications with indigenous groups um, as a minister i would have to confer with my department and uh, media staff in order to get any messages received from the indigenous groups. We have to decipher it, look at it, and, and work with our staff in order to respond to the indigenous groups. I, as minister, um, don't think that I would be allowed to just answer the question outright and communicate with the leaders myself, so I would have to confer with uh, the departments in that. I see. Thank you, Mr. Bonnerge. Next we have Mr. Simpson. <clears throat> Thank you. We, we've talked a lot about uh, communication and the importance of it and uh, how, how that built relationships and so communication with Indigenous governments 
is uh, obviously a priority and earlier I spoke about the need for perhaps formalizing this communication in certain respects. Uh, if there's complaints that calls to the department go unanswered or, or, or certain things are ignored, we need to figure out why that's happening and perhaps we have to put some things in place where there's policies or there's protocols that when we are contacted by an Indigenous government, there is a timeline for follow-up, there are people who are responsible for following up on that and sometimes uh, there's leader to leader uh, discussions. We, we, we can speak with Indigenous governments, but if it's something that happens for, within the department, you know, something in a band office or an Indigenous government office and they need to contact uh, the department, that's where those type of protocols come in. When it comes to the leader to leader contact, well, that's on us and, you know, that's our job, that's our responsibility to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Ms. Tom. Elect. Uh, communication is important. We heard from the leaders in the, um, the the leaders in Northwest Territories last week how we need to start mending these partnerships. Uh, you look at some of the some of the indigenous groups and some of the wonderful things that they're doing on their own. And with just a little bit of support from the government, it can go a long way. And I think that's really important to consider. Um, also, we have to, and we heard the frustrations, so we have to be um, considerate of the different regions. The, the, the diversity that's happening within the regions is really important, and we have to really get to know them, understand some of the history and the context of where the different indigenous groups have come from. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Tom. Next we have Ms. Chinna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. If I'm elected minister, I would, uh, Indigenous relationships will be an absolute priority. I look at the um, successes in my region. My region has, uh, for the community of Cova Lake, that they have built a seven-kilometer road on their own, independently, which had cost them $200,000 and would have been $7 million with the GWT. I also look at the solar panel project that is happening in Toledo and in Cova Lake as well too, and also the housing initiative that is being brought forward by Fort Good Hope. So going forward, it's imperative that we deal with the Indigenous groups and we start dealing with them and uh, recognizing them as partners and no longer clients. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Elect. Thank you, Ms. Chinna. Next we have Ms. Marcellus. I feel that, uh, thank you Mr. Speaker, I feel that my, uh, my job here is uh, to carry the mandate uh, uh, that I put forth with the Indigenous file and uh, sitting, sitting in the room last week on October the 17th uh, with all the Indigenous leaders was, uh, was incredible because I couldn't say anything. <laughs> And uh, usually, I, you know, and my door will always be open. They know that. I know the issues. I respect each and every one of them. And uh, I know uh, each and every one of them's issues. And uh, uh, it's an open door policy for me. It's a, a no brainer. And uh, I love the, the Indigenous people of the North just as I love everybody else in this Northwest Terrace because we're very unique, okay? We're very unique in that the majority of the people of the Northwest Territories is Indigenous, and our door should always be open to the leadership of this Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, uh, Speaker-elect. <clears throat> My whole life has been about communication and trust. For 23 years, I worked with municipal government starting out with nine in the region up to 19. So I built the trust working with them. You need to first and foremost listen to the people. You need to have open ears and understand what they're trying to say. I think we need to listen to Indigenous governments, municipal governments, and the residents of the Northwest Territories, just not certain people. We need to listen to everybody. And I look at my record as an employment, as my MLA record, my communities have trusted me, they've given me concerns and I've brought them forth to ministers and I do believe 
we need to be doing the same thing. We need to be working with the Indigenous governments. We need to be working with the municipal governments. And we need to be working with the residents. We need to have an open ear. And we need to also have our staff do the same thing. Our front staff, our front line staff should be in the communities. They should be working with them. If you don't, this is where the trust barrier comes in. So I just look at my record. I look at my relationships with Indigenous governments and municipal governments throughout the last 34 plus years and I th honestly think I've built the trust moving forward so I still think it's just part about working together. Thank you Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you Mr. Johnson. Next we have Mr. Riley. The uh, member for uh, Tuna Day Welliday for the question. Um, I think it's really important that, that actions speak a lot louder than words. Uh, we need to make some progress on the land rights negotiations and uh, do an analysis of what, what the issues are at each of the tables, make sure we've got the right people, the right kinds of resources, and get that going very quickly. Um, we, uh, we also heard that co-drafting of uh, post-evil le post legislation, regulations is important for people. We've got to make sure that we continue that and continue it on into the uh, regulation-making phase. Uh, when we met with the Indigenous uh, leaders, um, they said that the uh, memorandums of understanding, the intergovernmental agreements that they have, that we have with them are good, but we shouldn't be limiting our, our consultation to those agreements once a year meetings. People want us to, want uh, ministers to go to assemblies, want proactive visits uh, to communities. Um, I'm prepared to do that and work with, uh, or try to build some of the relationships on some of the relationships I've already developed through my, my years of being here. Um, UNDRIP, I think uh, we need to uh, make some progress on implementing UNDRIP here uh, in, in this assembly. Uh, those are some of the ideas that I would bring forward. Of course, I'd like to work with my cabinet colleagues to make sure that everybody's on the same page and regular MLAs, particularly from the smaller communities as well. Masi. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Next we have Ms. Nafkobi. Um, so I've been really encouraged by a lot of the discussion that we've been having lately uh, as we set the priorities with the tone of improving the relationship with uh, the Indigenous governments and groups in the territory. Um, one of the reasons that I did decide to put my name forward for Cabinet was a lot of uh, people outside of this room, etc. and my constituents that were urging me to go ahead and, and run for Cabinet, and included in, in amongst those were uh, former Indigenous leaders that have sat in this, these seats, as well as development corporations, uh, land corporations, um, others that I've worked with over the years, business owners. I had one, uh, I won't name names, but one business, Indigenous business owner who told me he was more excited about, to see the results in my riding than he was in others. So a lot of uh, my, my plan going forward is just the open door policy. I plan to listen. I plan to go for coffees. I'm a fairly social person. Um, so I just want to always be out there and reaching out and continuing to conti always build those bridges with the Indigenous organizations. And not only with their leadership, but also with workers on the ground and the people that I've met over the years in the course of my work. And that's really important to me. Um, my mother always taught me that you pay as much attention to the CEO as you do to the janitor and that every person has something to offer. So I will always be open, I will always listen, and I will continue to communicate well with the connections I already have and foster new and develop new connections with Indigenous groups. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knuckleby. Next we have Ms. Green. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. I, what I've seen in my experience uh, uh, in small communities is that even small changes would make a difference. For example, keeping the contact list up to date with who the most recent leadership is. I, I've reviewed lists that are hopelessly out of date. So if the letter is going to the community and it's addressed to the wrong person, likely there won't be any traction. Likewise, I find that uh, that we rely too much on email where it would be a better choice to pick up the phone uh, and actually talk to a person about the, the issue that you want to bring to their attention. Uh, I understand that capacity issues are at the heart of some of these issues as well, that the, the uh, First Nations are often underfunded, they don't have a full complement of staff, and that it can be difficult for the people who are there to juggle all the requests they have for their time. Uh, I think that 
this is an area where we really need to walk the talk. If we want better relationships with Indigenous people, we have to take a range of actions that start with things like keeping contact lists uh, up to date and include things like implementing UNDRIP and everything in between. Uh, I think we have to show that we are fully engaged, that it's as somebody said at the meeting last week, and I so <coughs> fully agree with and it was, reported, it was repeated here, that we treat Indigenous government organizations as partners and not as clients. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Next we have Mr. Johnson. I believe we uh, have been handed an overwhelming mandate for change. I believe that started when we elected nine women to this assembly and it continued today when we elected K Caroline Cochran as our premier. Um, I also believe as we set our priorities in the last weeks and we table them tomorrow, it is your job as cabinet ministers to follow up on those and ensure those changes are made in your departments. However, I think we must recognize we are not the only decision makers here. And my question to you as cabinet future ministers is how will you approach sometimes and likely resistance to change within your own departments? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. First on our list, we have Ms. Chinna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for your question. I know that being in a ministerial position that we will end up um, not always agreeing. I know we will encounter scenarios and situations where we will be disagreeing on a lot of uh, situations. But at the end of the day, we are the 19th Legislative Assembly. We do have an obligation to meet the needs of the people at the grassroots level, the people who are working in our GNWT offices and our stakeholders as well in the Northwest Territories. I feel that it's imperative that we continue that relationship and the rela relationship building. In all due respect, I feel that going forward, we need to change with what is better for the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Chinna. Next we have Ms. Green. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect, and I appreciate the question from the member. Uh, in fact, I, I think we should expect resistance to uh, the changes that uh, we have adopted in our priorities. I think the, the first thing that we need to do is understand what that resistance is. Is, is that a resistance because the idea is too far out? Um, it's beyond the capacity of the person you're talking to? Uh, what, what is the origin of the resistance to change? Uh, it might not be simple obstinacy. It might be actually a problem with, um, with understanding what's required or acquiring the skills uh, to respond to the changes that are being proposed. Um, I have already said, and, and I, I will say again, that I'm committed to evidence-based decision-making. I'm also a very good communicator of how I get to the decisions that I, that I make. And so I, I would uh, make a special effort, of course, to uh, reveal this evidence to the people I'm, I'm talking to and, and to ask them to come on board to create the conditions in which they can come on board. Uh, finally, though, uh, we as the politicians, as, as Mr. Simpson said, often enough during his campaign to become Premier, the buck stops with us. We are ultimately responsible for this. And so if, if change isn't happening, we have to figure out if the soft touch doesn't uh, work with our innate skills, we're going to have to ramp things up in order to make the changes that we have been asked to make. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Next we have Ms. Marcellus. I will abide by the, uh, the priorities that are set by the 18 members of this uh, 19th Assembly. I will ensure that the decisions that are being made are good for all the people of the Northwest Territories at the Cabinet level. I will also ensure that management takes direction, working with management on making sure we all the pros and cons before the decisions are made and I will ensure that the that we respect the public service and the people that do all the jobs to make us better leaders 
Uh, this is the way I've always managed before. And uh, everybody has a say and everybody has a, in the department and uh, making good, solid decisions. That's what I'm about and I'm really results oriented. And uh, I bring uh, strong leadership to ensure that these are upheld. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Ms. Nockleby. Um, so the only constant in life is change. So it's funny to me that, or ironic, that that actually seems to be one of the things that people struggle with the most is when their life is maybe disrupted or something is going to change, and it's that fear of the unknown. And so I feel that the best way to go about um, diluting that fear or in reassuring my department that this change isn't necessarily a bad thing, even though it might be difficult to go through it at the time, is education. Uh, the more that people understand that the reason for change and why it's happening, then they will be less fearful of that change itself. And if you can help your staff to understand that while we may have to go through some difficult moments to get to the end result, that the end result is going to be better for them than the situation you're in, I think that will go a long way for um, sort of decreasing that fear of change. Uh, people want reassurance. They want to know what's going on. They want information. So I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I'm all about data. I'm all about information. There will be no secrets. Um, I know there will be issues with uh, you know, solidarity and all that, and I would definitely be mindful of that and follow protocols, but I am an open book. I think those of you that have got to know me in the last three weeks realize I'm pretty straightforward. What you see is what you get, and that's the way that I plan to run my department. Um, so every single person will know that they can come into my office, they can talk to me about their fears, that they, it's a safe space, that they're not going to be retaliated upon. If they disagree with me, then that's fine, because the only way I'm going to learn is if other people are going to tell me what their opinions are. I do not want a group of yes people. So I will definitely go in and have that uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knuckleby. Next, we have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Speaker-elect. To me, it's about communication to begin with, to explain to the bureaucracy why we're going the direction we're going. Once we get that overall arching picture there, then you need to talk to them and understanding what the challenges they have with the process that we're moving forward. There may be something that we, with our policies that may challenge us doing, moving it forward. So we need to first work with them. And then, if it doesn't happen then, then, as our J Mr. Simpson said, buck stops here. So you need to first work with them and try to get them to understand the reasons we're moving it. Communicate, and like Ms. B said, they may say, no, this doesn't make any sense. And so they can explain, but again, it's communication, working with them to make what's better for the people in Northwest Territory. So it's not using your heavy hand, it's using a velvet glove, but at the end of the day, you may have to have an iron fist inside. But at the very beginning, it's about working with the people, communicating the vision that we're moving forward on, and then go from there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Next, we have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I, I see myself as a minister. I would really like to meet with the senior staff, visit uh, the offices of the department in Yellowknife, outside of Yellowknife, get a, a good understanding of who the staff are, what their issues are, and what the barriers may be to some of the, the changes that are uh, um, that might be required as a result of the mandate. So I think it's really important to get to know the staff in the department. Um, and I'll be looking for a uh, how-to approach, not why we can't do something. Um, I think in, in order to make sure that change happens, you have to have good evaluation, good monitoring in place to make sure that it actually does happen. And that that's understood clearly by everybody as part of the system. Um, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, I too also believe very much in uh, evidence-based decision making. Um, I think that if cha when change is happening, it can be difficult for folks. Communications is obviously going to be very important. It's going to be important to work with standing committees so that they also understand why change is not is or not happening and the reasons for that. Um, 
Yeah, and if changes need to be made in terms of staffing, that's not something I'm afraid to do, but uh, hopefully it would never come to that. As leaders, we have to be held accountable at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Next we have Ms. Tom. Speaker-elect. Uh, the people of the Northwest Territories are relying on this assembly for some change. You know, when we're doing our campaigning, we're going door to door and we're hearing from our constituents, from the people that um, there needs to be change. And cha within change, there can, there, there'll be resistance. We know that. And it's just how you go about taking that resistance. Um, you know, we're all, if, if elected, we'll all be given different portfolios. It's so important to learn about your por portfolio, communicate, earn that trust, and I think that can go a long way with just working with the, the people that, are, that, that you have to work with. So I think communication, trust is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tom. Next we have Mr. Simpson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Uh, during my, my brief run for Premier, I, I received a lot of feedback from members of the public service. They liked a lot of the things I was talking about in terms of how to change the system and, and, and change the way we do business. So the public service is ready for change. The, the, they are not opposed to change. We need to support them to make that change. I think that's the issue. Uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues earlier and they said that uh, you know, the government will have a policy out and then the public service finally figures out how to implement it and then they change the policy. So people aren't resistant to change, but they need to be supported. And if there are problems with it, they need to be heard. They need to be part of the system. There needs to be that feedback loop I've been talking about. And if there is a problem, if there's a bottleneck when it comes to um, this change, if there's a, a, someone in a position somewhere who, no matter what you do, just won't comply, then that's when you need to uh, lean on your premier because as a minister, you, you can't hire and fire people in your, in your department. The management of it is, uh, is done by the deputy ministers, which are responsible to the premier. So we need to work as a team, and we need to make sure that, we have a pre that our premier is going to have our back. And I'm not sure if she's had uh, any pushback from her department in the past for any changes she wanted to make. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that uh, sh she knows what it's like, and uh, she'd be there to support us, and, and we need that kind of support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Mr. Bonners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Um, it's important to note that employees are our most important resources. Um, I come from the Department of Infrastructure. Prior to that, it was the Department of Public Works and Services. And there was another Department of Transportation where they amalgamated the, the departments. And there was messages going around saying that they're going to amalgamate the positions. So they had, they had uh, meetings with us. It, it wasn't clearly defined in no emails. There was lots of skepticism. And there was fear, fear of losing your jobs. Because now you're amalgamating departments and there might be duplication. So um, I've been involved in those kind of situations and at, at the other end of it. So. Um, I'm kind of like becoming a professional at maybe trying to alleviate those positions now. You know, you've got to alleviate that fear, that fear mongering and let them know that, you know, a lot of their positions are not going to get affected. Um, and it's important to relay to them the, you know, the, 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 necess the necessity for the change in your department and what the future outlook is for your department also, you know, you need to relay those messages and, and uh, explain the reason why that change is important. Um, usually good meeting, meetings with your departments are very informative and, uh, and can uh, alleviate a lot of these fears. Uh, I guess my time is up, so I'll <laughs> stop there. Masi. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonnerouge. Next we have Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. I think uh, with an open-handed approach when uh, working together with your staff and not letting them know what you're expecting of them and uh, when you treat your staff good, I think we could all come together and for the common good for the people of the Northwest Territories. 
and uh, making sure that we remind them that, that that's why we're here, to serve the people. And uh, for myself, I think we have to uh, lead by example, um, and change is good. And this 19th assembly, we have to do something. It's, it, this is a, a get or done assembly instead of uh, and working for the benefit of all the people in North East Territories. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Next we have Ms. Wozniak. Wozniak. Um, I have three things. I hope I get through all of them. Uh, the first is to lead by example, develop an understanding about the functioning of the departments, and, but show flexibility ourselves and also show courage ourselves so that when we're going forward and asking other people to be courageous with change, they're seeing that coming from us first. Second is to engage people in the process. I think someone's already spoken about that. That although we're providing the priorities, the mandate, that's a vision, but a lot of the real solutions are actually going to come from within the public service. And so people should feel engaged in this process and not scared of it. The third is to create a culture of accountability, uh, which I would see doing firstly with timely and transparent communication about what is happening and about the processes that we're asking people to buy into and engage in and to create clear points of accountability along the way, both for ourselves and also for throughout the department at different levels. Change doesn't have to mean surprises. It shouldn't mean surprises. It just means showing people what the processes will be. I believe we actually have a very strong public service. I think we have a public service that wants to be engaged in a process of change, uh, and I think we just need to give them the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Ms. Wozniak. Any it appears we have no further questions for the Executive Council candidates. Uh, Ms. Cochran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Many of us as Premier talked about building the relationship and working better together um, as members of the Legislative Assembly. I've often said, and I've told myself to it, that honesty is a strength and a value that I cherish in myself and I cherish in my cabinet ministers. I want to know the commitment from every minister that is putting their name forward, everyone that's putting their name forward for minister. What will you do, whether you're elected or you're not elected, to help build the relationship between regular MLAs and cabinet ministers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Let's start off with uh, Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Elect, uh, thank you for the question. I think this is why we're here. You know, we um, we have to put everything, all our differences, at the door in regards to when you come into the assembly, in the great uh, in this chamber, and respecting the chamber and why we're here. We have to be more. You're open-minded, I guess, in regards to. We're here for one reason. It's the best to provide service for the people of the Northwest Territories. And uh, putting, uh, checking, uh, checking your ego at the door and for the benefit of all the people and who you're representing, and I think that's the way to be. And uh, that's all you have is your word, trust. And um, if you don't have that, I don't know why you're here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Next we have Ms. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Communication is key. Um, you know, we all, we all come here wanting to best represent not only our constituents, but as a member of executive, the whole residents of the Northwest Territories. Um, I mentioned last week when we were talking about, like we've spent <clears throat> the last three weeks together, and at the end of it, I said, no matter what happens Friday at 5 or Thursday at 5, whatever the date may be, we all need to maintain that communication. It's, it's very important. That's the way you get things done. And, um, you know, I, I'll work hard. I'm dedicated. I come in with a new lens that could be come both positive and negative, but that's... That's my commitment to this executive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. -elect. Thank you, Ms. Tom. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, our Premier-elect is correct. We did talk a lot about this uh, when, we were, when we were speaking about being Premier because relationships are so important. And, and some of the basic things are just walking the halls. Uh, you know, I, I, I get here too early in the morning, but uh, when, when I get here later, I like to take the long way around. 
uh, so I, I go by people's offices and I can say hi and I can just uh, see what's going on. I think that's a big thing and no matter what side you're on, you need to do that more often. I, I sat with the, uh, the Premier-elect in her office on a number of occasions discussing issues. We need to implement some of those standing committee uh, procedures uh, in terms of how they interact with uh, the executive that uh, actually the, the, the minister helped to pioneer in the last assembly. Uh, we need to, if I'm a regular member, I'm going to do my best to help guide the, uh, the regular members uh, to avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, we, we uh, ran into in the last assembly that sort of uh, made communication or hindered communication. So there's, there's lots to do. I've got lots of ideas and uh, I look forward to implementing them no matter which side of the, uh, which side I'm on. We're all on the same side, how about no matter which hall I'm down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I, too, uh, endorse a lot of the recommendations that came out of the Special Committee on Transition Matters. And uh, I talked about some of those in my uh, speech earlier today, um, things like ongoing training of MLAs. Um, we need to more effectively use caucus, uh, which is all of us as regular MLAs leaving our hats at the door to talk and resolve issues. Uh, and I think we, we can do a better job at that. Um, we need to find ways to more frequently visit each other and build working relationships. Um, and I, the minister knows that I did work with her well in the last assembly, or the, the, the premier-elect, I should say. Uh, standing committees are very, very important. They play a crucial role in how regular MLAs work with cabinet ministers, and we have to make the standing committees work a lot better. Some of the ideas that I've had in, from the special committee report, pre-budget consultations, cl clear legislative proposals, and if they get changed, bring them back to committee, have plain language materials ready so that when committees take bills on the road, they can do a better job at uh, uh, promoting or consulting with communities uh, uh, and stakeholders as well. Um, those are, are some of the ideas. Uh, most importantly, no surprises. That needs to be the hallmark of this assembly moving forward. And there are conventions that can help with that, but we shouldn't have surprises happening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Next we have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Speaker-elect. Do what I did last four years. It's about walking down the halls. It's just not talking to the ministers, it's talking about to the regular MLAs, to get to know people. It's about understanding people as you move forward. But you have to be honest. I've gone into the offices of ministers and told them exactly what I was going to say before I said it on the floor. So I'm being very honest and upfront. It's also, Premier-elect, I've had numerous conversations with her over the four years. It's about working together and communicating. And it's whether it's on committees or individuals, it's about working together, and I think it's about team building. And it's the ability to be able to walk into anybody's office and sit there and chat and have a conversation. It doesn't have to be about politics. It could be about anything. It's about getting to know people moving forward because that's what it is about building this. We are a family of 19. That's what we have. We have nine sisters. I have nine sisters and nine brothers, right? That's what we have here right now. This is what we are. We are going to be a family and we need to be working together. So we need to communicate together and you need to be honest. If you don't agree with it, don't say you agree with it and then walk down the, or agree with it and sit and then come out here and say something different. If I tell you what I'm going to tell you, that is what I'm going to be doing. It is about honesty. It is about respect because at the end of the day, you're honest to somebody that's showing respect to that individual. And that, to me, is the most important part of it. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, next we have Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. Uh, much of my speech dealt with this, uh, with this issue. I, I think it's very important uh, to develop relationships with people, obviously, to get to know them as people in order to develop uh, trust and, and mutual respect. Um, and. I don't need to tell anyone how to do that. I think we're all here able to develop relationships. Um, there, uh, there needs to be open and honest communication and it needs to be proactive. I want to echo Mr. O'Reilly's comments about there not being any surprises. Some of the most disruptive moments of the 18th Assembly uh, turned on surprises 
uh, from cabinet or from the premier. And uh, we do have a communications protocol as, as uh, a caucus and uh, it's something that will soon be introduced to the new members. It's a very important document because it lays out how communication should work and really must work in order for, uh, for us to be able to work uh, consistently and, and cooperatively together. Uh, as I said in my speech, the, the standing committees are, are essential and um, there could be a lot more done uh, with consultation with the committees on regular business such as budgets and policy and regulations as well as, uh, as, well as legislation to, um, to help us uh, work collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Next we have Ms. Wozniak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Um, I guess, first of all, as uh, my member from the Hende has already said, I don't see us as separate. I think we are all here to fulfill a role to govern in the best of our abilities. I'm fairly new to the internal processes. I was surprised that people don't walk up and down the hall and talk to each other in the mornings. That seems like an obvious thing to me. And I am surprised that not more time is spent together in caucus. I am surprised that there's not more time spent between a minister and a cabinet doing a really direct, uh, a direct communication in terms of trying to make bills and legislation better before it has to hit this floor. So uh, those things seem obvious to me. I, I think I talked to somebody who'd been in here before about every minister having sort of a non-cabinet buddy, if you will, someone that they can check in with on a regular basis in a more direct way. And it was suggested that when that's tried, well, then the minister gets burned. Um, but I want to assume the best. I want to assume the best from everybody that's here. And so to me, that having those relationships that you can check in and say, where are we at on this, doing a bit of a gut check, uh, I'd like to think that we can build that trust based on the communications we've had over the last three weeks here. Um, and really, if communication fails, to me, the solution is never to shut it down and walk away. You actually have to double down. That when there's been a breakdown in communication, that's when you actually have to go in and make extra efforts to try even really hard to, to make it better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wozniak. Next, we have Mr. Bonnerge. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Um, I think communication is, uh, is a really important trait that uh, everyone should have. As you're breaking down, down uh, communication barriers, um, that you know, we should be talking to each other, maybe even saying you know, uh, good morning or hi, short chats uh, every, every day in the mornings, make time for each other. It's very important to, to, to build that working relationship. Communication is ultimately very important for that. Um, and, and it's also very important as we're working on uh, trying to rebuild the consensus government style, that uh, communication is very important in that aspect there. Um, so I would really encourage everyone there to, to not hold up in your little office and that and just be walking around and talk to everyone. That's, that's going to be very important because uh, we've got to work together for the next four years and, and that's very important. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Barnerge. Next we have Ms. Marcellos. Thank you, Speaker-elect. First of all, I want to say that whether I uh, become a cabinet minister or remain an ordinary MLA. Either way, I want you to know that I will be the voice for the people. I feel very strongly about the people of the Northwest Territories, all people, and I have a special thing in my heart for the Indigenous people. I am very honest and I'm very sincere. I'm very results oriented and I'm a great communicator. I don't get my way all the time, but I'm, a, I'm able to leave it at the door. I've learned a lot in that, these last three weeks and I'll learn a lot in the future and will be from all of you in this house, including the staff. Because you know what? We have great staff here. and. Uh, you know, I respect each and everybody that comes through the door, always did, because uh, that is part of our culture. 
as an Indigenous person. We welcome everybody. We want everybody to be part of what we know and what we have, and we always share. And uh, I look forward to sharing all those ideas with each and every one of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Ms. Knuckleby. So I agree with all of uh, the comments made by my colleagues here. Um, I think communication is key uh, to building relationships and trust amongst us. Um, I do like to talk, but I'm also a fairly active listener. I know that that was something that was commented to me during the forums, that I was always interested in listening to what others had to say. Um, my parents were educators. My dad was a principal, my mom was a teacher, first in their families to go to school. Um, so for us, I was always taught to be a lifelong learner. And one of the things that I realized coming into this process was how little I actually know. And in the last, say, two months, even including the campaign, has been the, the, one of the steepest learning curves of my life. And so I'm, I already have the mindset to come in here and learn from all of you and every one of you. And if I end up in cabinet as a first time and there's someone that has been in cabinet before, I'm going to go to them and ask them, how does this get done? or if I have a question or a concern. So my plan is just to go in and continue to talk to everyone. I was actually really shocked when I came in to realize that uh, the cabinet offices were in one section of the, of the building and the regular MLAs were in another. And to me, that struck me as really an odd situation for a consensus-style government. I actually think it would probably do better to have staggered cabinet, regular cabinet, regular, and then that would force that interaction. I can guarantee you I will also be walking the hallway I will be coming to all of you. I know I'm not an expert. As an engineer, I'm liability uh, adverse, so I'm not going to say I know something I don't know. So I plan for all of you to teach me those things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knuckleby. Next we have Ms. Chinna. I was thinking about this question, and I thought that um, we're all very new to the 19th Legislative Assembly. The staff is amazing. I've had probably the best week, either three weeks here. And um, I was really excited to know that my uh, colleagues from the Bullford Delta and um, that very familiar with them coming into the house and just re-engaging that relationship again. And also have a lot of respect for the amount of skills that surround this table. I think looking at, this, um, looking at this question and how do we build the relationships between the MLA and the cabinet, and I just think it already exists. It's already there. And I think we need to maintain it. We need to follow through with it. Whether we're going to be walking up and down those halls 10 times a day, so be it. Those relationships have already built. I'm very honored to be working with the amount of people that have been elected and the skills that are brought into the table. I brought in some issues up to some of the MLAs and I got such an incredible response. Very passionate and a lot of rela relatable issues that are very similar throughout the Northwest Territories. And I think going forward I feel very confident in maintaining that relationship and there's going to be some days that we don't, um, we don't agree with each other and we're, you know, and we're going to be fighting for infrastructure that's needed in one region compared to the other. Then so be it. At the end of the day we value and we measure our success through the people we serve. Thank you Mr. Elect. Thank you Ms. Chinna. I'll try this again. <laughs> it appears there are no further questions for the Executive Council candidates. I want to thank all candidates who agreed to put their names forward for Executive Council. Members are now asked to proceed to the clerk's table to receive three ballots, one for the Northern candidates, one for the Yellowknife candidates, and one for the Southern candidates. Members on each ballot. A failure to cast two votes on a ballot will result in the entire ballot being rejected. Please proceed to the voting booths to mark your ballots and then place them in the ballot box located in front of the clerk's table. Thank you.
Are there any other members wishing to vote who have not voted yet? There be no one else wishing to vote, I will now proceed to vote myself. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare the voting process closed. The ballot box will now be taken to the clerk's office where the ballots will be counted. The bells will ring for five minutes to bring the members back in once the results are determined. Thank you.
honorary colleagues, members of the public, it is my duty to announce that there is a need for a second ballot for the North and the Yellowknife constituencies. The nominees for the second ballot are for the North constituencies. Just one second. Uh, Ms. Chinna, Mr. Jacobson, and Ms. Tom. This means that there, there was a tie for second place. And also in the Yellowknife, we have Ms. Green, Ms. Nocklaby, and Ms. Wozniak. <laughs> Before we proceed to the vote, are there any nominees wishing to withdraw at this time? There being no such withdrawals, the ballots are available as before. Please proceed to vote.
Are there any more members wishing to vote who have not voted yet? There be no one else wishing to vote, I will now proceed to vote myself. I declare the voting process closed. The ballot box will now be taken to the clerk's office where the ballots will be counted. The bells will be rung for five minutes to bring the members back in once the results are de determined. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I will now call the Territorial Leadership Committee back to order. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare that you have elected the following individuals to serve on the Executive Council. From the North, Ms. Chinna and Ms. Tom. And from the South, Mr. Simpson, Hayover North, and Mr. Thompson. From Yellowknife, one second. <laughs> Miss Knuckleby and Miss was was Nick. I get those. Congratulations. These individuals will be recommended for appointment to the Executive Council by way of formal motion in the House tomorrow. I would like to thank everyone for your contributions and participation today. This meeting of the Territorial Leadership Committee is now concluded. We adjourn, but before we do, we have our meeting of regular members in committee room A tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you.